Today is my heaviest day of the year. We talk about September 21st all the time. I've written a book about it, September 21st, the day I woke up in ICU and I couldn't feel my legs for three days and they wondered if my liver was going to fail. You have heard this story over and over. You've heard me tell it. You've read about it. You've listened to the podcast. You've heard me speak. You know, all of those things we talk about the day I woke up. What we don't talk um, about ever, very, very rarely, is the day that I decided to die, September 20th. The day that I said, I can't do this. I can't do this anymore. I can't fake it. I can't drag my family through what I thought was about to come. I can't go on. We don't talk about that day ever. We're talking about it today. We're talking about it today. <sighs> um, man, when you reach rock bottom, when you believe there is no more hope, when you are convinced that this, this thing, this life is never going to get better, that it is only going to get worse, that nobody loves you, that nobody believes you, that nobody believes in you, that nobody cares. When you reach that point, it doesn't matter how long you've been married, how many kids you got, how cute they are, how much they adore you, how much they need you. None of that stuff can be rationalized anymore. So September 20th, 2012, where I was. And I had been in church all my life. I'd done two years of ministry school. I was working in a church as a pastor, been married five years, had a little boy that would turn a year old on the 22nd. And on the 20th of September, I gave up. And when you reach that point, it's this it's this false sense of calm. All the, all the noise, all the white noise of anxiety that's been screaming in your ears. Um, the black dog of depression that's been barking and nipping at your heels. All of those demons shut up and they get really quiet because their work is done. It gets really quiet. I've wondered so many times, go with me here for a second, I've wondered so many times if it got really quiet for Judas. He threw the money back at the religious leader's feet and he fled. And in that space between throwing the money back at their feet and going and finding a rope and throwing it over the branch, and deciding to hang himself. I wonder how quiet it was. He had been tormented. He knew that no one would believe him, that no one would care. He was convinced that this would only get worse, that this would never get better. I wonder how quiet it got in, in those sort of twilight hours between giving up and dying. It was quiet for me. I read my Bible. I wrote letters to all my people that I cared about, telling them how sorry I was. It was really dark, sitting in that hotel room with my granddaddy's Bible. Why am I telling you all this today? It's the 20th of September. Um, this is the day I gave up. This is the day I, I thought that I lost hope. And here I am. And so... I tell you all that to say I, I get it. I hear you. I know what it's like. I have been there. And every year on this day, um, I let myself journey back there a little bit. So I sat here in my truck. I got to work about a half an hour early. I sat here and meditated. And I was taken back to that little boy 
in the side yard at my parents' home when I was tiny and I was abused. Because that's where it starts for me. It doesn't start on September 20th and losing my hope. It doesn't start at the age of 12 being addicted to porn. It, it doesn't start losing my job when I'm 28. It starts at almost four years old and being molested. And so I traveled back there. I meditated and went there. And I told that little boy how sorry I was. And I held him close and I told him how much I loved him. Right? I know this sounds weird. If you've never meditated, if you've never um, let yourself go there, um, it sounds strange. But I had to do it. Um, and, I, and I do that every once in a while. And I had to hold that little boy and tell him that he made it, that he's okay, that life has gotten better. Because, friends, life gets better. Now, it takes hard work. My God, it takes hard work. I have worked so hard. Lindsay has worked so hard. I have friends and family who can't talk about it. They can't talk about those days, and that's okay too. Um, but this day every year, I have to forgive myself. I have to forgive myself for wanting to abandon my family. And not wanting to, that's a terrible word. I didn't want to abandon my family. But I didn't think I had any other choice. I didn't think I had any other option. I thought I was doing them a favor. And so I have to forgive myself every year on this day. Anybody that thinks that forgiveness is just a one-time process, that it's just once and done, I disagree. When it is something deeply traumatic, something that has hit you at the core of your identity, I don't think it's just a one-time thing of, okay, I forgive that, now let's move on. I remember. I remember. And I need to remember. I need to be reminded that there was a day in my life five years ago when I gave up on all hope of anything ever getting better. I need to remember that. Because there are people watching right now who feel like things will never get better. And I need to tell you that's a great big fat lie. Things will get better. I don't know when. I don't know how. I know it's not a magic snap of Jesus' cosmic fingers. But I have seen things get really bad. Really dark. Scary as hell. And through a long, patient, difficult process of getting really honest, digging through the darkest, most difficult, awful, nasty, terrible things, things have gotten better through prayer, through counseling, through gut level, gut wrenching honesty. Medication, meditation, Things have gotten better. Much, much better. But I had to forgive myself. I had to forgive myself. And I forgive myself every year on this day. I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow. In tomorrow's podcast, um, the Ask Steve Austin podcast, if you go to iTunes and search hashtag Ask Steve Austin all together, hashtag Ask Steve Austin, or you go to AskSteveAustin.com tomorrow, Lindsay and I are talking together for the first time about what these last five years have meant. And, and the last five years for us have meant a remembering. It's a lot like the table. Um, you think about um, the communion table in religious circles, in Christian circles, we go and we break bread and we drink wine. And on the front of that table, it says, do this in remembrance of me. So it's a holy moment for me. It's heavy. It's hard. It's difficult. It breaks my heart. But I do this to remember. I remember. I remember the little boy that was broken in the side yard. I remember 
the little boy whose brain had images that should have never been implanted on his brain at the age of four and at the age of 12 with pornography. And every day after that for 20 years, I remember. I remember losing hope. I remember being so torn because I loved Jesus with all my heart. And I equally wanted to die. I remember. I remember. But I don't live there. I don't stay there. Those things happened and I call them by name and I acknowledge them and I forgive the bad choices I made, the unthinkable things that other people did and I choose to not allow the worst days of my life to define the rest of my life. That's what my wife said. The worst day of my life doesn't get to define the rest of my life. Am I changed forever? Yes. But will I let those things rule me, dominate me, control me for the rest of my life? No, I won't. I will be more kind. I will be more understanding. I will be more patient. I will be more gracious. Absolutely. But I will not live in fear. I will not live with shame. I will not live with this uncontrollable guilt. I can't. I won't. I choose to believe that God is in control even when I can't see it, even when I don't understand it, even when I can't explain it and put it into words. I have hope that all things work out that God makes all things, all people, new. That's my hope today. If you need hope, if you need somebody to talk to, if you feel like you are drowning underneath the weight of it all, email me, steve at iamsteveaustin.com. If you have done the hard work of recovery and you're ready to go to the next level, you want to talk about life coaching, go to iamsteveaustin.com, click on the coaching link, and let's talk. Let's schedule a session. Let's talk about it. Let's do this thing. Let's do it. There is hope, friends. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let go. But reach out when you need help. Reach out when you need hope. Reach out when you need someone to link arms with you and say, I got you. I got you. Life is worth living. It is worth digging through all of the difficult, horrible, unthinkable things. It is worth it. But you got to do the hard work. You got to forgive yourself. You got to forgive other people. You have to do what Ed Bacon says and choose to see God in other people. Choose to see God in your offenders. Choose to see God in your worst moment, in your biggest mistakes, because you are so much more than just the sum of your mistakes. God loves you. There is grace for you every moment of every day to bind your wounds, to heal your heart, to lift you from a lowly place. Don't give up. Thanks for watching.